Now, a few weeks ago, before Dan's girlfriend Beth went back to Northern Ireland, we had a couple of evenings when they cooked for us and they made curries and really proper curries like you would get in a restaurant, not just stuff out of jars, but made from first principles and making their own onion puree and using raw spices. Uh, brilliant, really good, outstanding curries. And uh, Jono recently has made his chili con carne once or twice, which is brilliant. Now, this is a landmark. And the reason is because um, when you first have kids, obviously they start out as babies, they are useless. They can't do anything for themselves. They literally can't feed themselves. So you spoon feed them. You put the food in their mouths. And then as they get a little older, um, when they can feed themselves, you still have to provide the food, of course. You make it available for them. You set up the meals. You put it in front of them. When they get a bit older again, uh, when they're teenagers, what we found at least is uh, we had meal times, but generally they would scavenge if they were hungry. They'd just make their way around the house and find something to eat and, and that would work out fine. And now we're making the transition to a much more exciting situation, uh, for us anyway, where not only can they create their own food, uh, even we're benefiting from it. Now that's brilliant. It's such an important transition. It's part of growing up. Now this is what it's like as Christians as well. When someone is a brand new baby Christian, you spoon feed them. You, you tell them everything they need to know. You, you try and help them out with everything as it goes. But as somebody becomes a more mature Christian, you start to want them to be strong enough to provide their own food to look after themselves. And as they approach maturity, as they start to become mature Christians and the kinds of people who the church doesn't just help but depends upon, then you want them to be feeding others as well. Um, and the writer of the letter to the Hebrews uh, was talking about exactly this when he wrote these words in Hebrews 5, verse 12. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. Now, what I want to ask today is where are we in this progression? in this story. Now obviously some people really are brand new Christians, brilliant, we're so pleased to have you with us and we'll be more than happy uh, to look after you to, uh, as best we can. But for those of us who have been Christians for a bit longer, uh, are we still relying on spoon feeding or on people providing meals for us or are we starting to be able to feed ourselves and even feed others? You know sometimes when I hear Christians talk about different churches that they're visiting, especially if they're uh, newly moved to an area and they're thinking about where they're going to go, you sometimes hear phrases like well, you know, Church X has a welcoming atmosphere and it's got uh, really good music, but I, I don't feel like I'm getting fed there. Now, Church X has room for improvement, for sure. You know, it'd be better if it, it were providing more nourishment. But if you've been a Christian for a while, you should be feeding yourself. You should be in a position to feed yourself. Now, Fiona and I have been thinking about this, uh, especially through lockdown, because, of course, the church's opportunities to feed its members have been reduced enormously. We, we've got these online services and we do what we can and we hope that we're reaching you and we hope that we're, we're giving you what you need, but we can't really tell. You know, we've lost that feedback loop. We don't know what's landing, what isn't, what's working, what's helping people. So we sometimes think, what is the church going to look like when we do eventually come out of lockdown? I don't necessarily just mean the first couple of weeks when we're, we can allow a few people in the building, but when Hopefully the time eventually comes when we're back to normal. What will we have? What sort of church will we have? Will it be weakened by this time? Will it be feeble? Will it need feeding up again? <coughs> Beg your pardon. Or will it have retained its strength? Will our members have learned? Will we all have learned to feed ourselves? Or will the church be stronger than before? And I think then about uh, the church in China that was shut down with very heavy persecution during the, uh, the Cultural Revolution. And no one in the West knew what had become of the church in China. It was so locked down and hidden away. Uh, and yet when those restrictions were lifted, it became apparent that the Chinese church had flourished in that situation. And not just in numbers, but in the strength of the Christianity of its members. Now, will we be like that maybe? When we get to the end of lockdown, will we finally get back together and realise how much we've grown? Again, not necessarily in numbers, although that would be great, but in, in terms of how each of us individually has grown. Or will it be that we'll come back after a year, whatever it is, and there's just Tim and Katrina? Well, 
I hope we're better than that. But the thing is, we've each got to get away from the idea that our spiritual strength is the church's responsibility. Now, the church absolutely is there to help us and to lift us up and to guide us and comfort us and direct us and do all sorts of great things. But ultimately, each of us is responsible for himself or herself. Now, I think Christians don't always get that, partly because the words that are used for church leaders are not super helpful. Uh, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, that the church leader is called a priest. Now, that's an Old Testament word, which means somebody who represents us to God. So, if you take that word literally, then, then you're thinking, if you're a Roman Catholic Christian, then you're thinking that it's the priest's job to go to God on your behalf. But that's not right. Or, in the Anglican Church, the leader, of course, is often called a vicar. Uh, and that's not much better, because it comes from the same root as the word vicarious. You know, if... Uh, if somebody who's too old to play football, you could say they might take vicarious pleasure in watching others play. So what it means is somebody who does something for someone else. So again, the idea is the vicar of a church is the person who does stuff on behalf of the congregation. But that's not how the church looks in the New Testament. Even pastor, you know, we, we talk about Tim sometimes as being the pastor of this church. Now that word means shepherd. Now obviously, I'm not going to say that's wrong. It, it isn't as though there's no shepherding involved but you know the image that gives is perhaps not always the most helpful one because the idea there is of us as helpless sheep just being herded along and moved into place by Tim and that that's not his job in fact if you look at the descriptions of the the um, the leaders jobs in Ephesians chapter 4 it talks about apostles prophets pastors teachers evangelists what it says is that their job is not to pastor and to teach and to evangelize but to raise up the people of God so that they can do those things. And that's Tim's goal and the goal of all of us who are involved in any kind of leadership role in this church is not to do things for the congregation, but to equip the congregation so that every member can do these things. You know, Paul in the second letters of the Corinthians writes that we must all stand before Christ to be judged and we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Now, uh, to be clear, that's not talking about whether or not um, the salvation that Christ has won for us is secure. It is secure, but it's talking about within that, then what are the rewards? Um, and we'll have to give an account for how we've lived. And the thing is, it's going to be no good if, if I stand before the throne of Christ on the final day and I say, well, you know, Tim lived a good Christian life. Doesn't that get me something? No. You know, Jesus is going to look at me and say, how have I lived? Now, I don't want you to hear this as a sort of a threat of judgment. That isn't it at all. Um, the issue is that if we neglect our own relationship with God, if we don't take responsibility for our own Christian growth, then we are going to miss out. I'm not just talking about the way things go in, in, in eternal judgment. I'm talking about here and now and day by day and week by week. You know what? I say day by day, of course, that immediately makes you think about the song day by day. And it nails it so well, it captures that. You remember the words that what we aspire to is to see God more clearly, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more nearly. And those three things follow on from each other. And that's the natural, healthy Christian growth that every one of us should be progressing through. Now, we are made for God. We were made by him, but also for him, to know him and to love him. Our greatest satisfaction in this life and the next is in him, is in knowing him better, seeing him more clearly, huh. and loving him more dearly and following him more nearly. But we will not see him as himself if we only see him second hand, if we only see him through what other people bring to us, however brilliant those people are. You know, you don't need to listen to me on a Sunday morning, you can go and download sermons by Tim Keller or Rick Warren or whoever you think is, is the best Bible teacher out there. You know that everybody's got podcasts and things now. And yet, however good what those people give you is, it's not the same thing as you yourself spending your own time with God and hearing from him for yourself. It's second-hand news. Don't you want the first-hand news? All right then, but how, you may ask me. Well, you know, we're going to look at the example of Jesus, way better to go. 
You'll remember that after he was baptised, John baptised him, the very next thing that happens is, well, I'll read it to you. Here we are in Luke chapter 3. One day when the crowds were being baptised, Jesus himself was baptised. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The wilderness? Why? This incredible moment where God himself physically manifests and speaks to him. Wouldn't you think that would be the moment where he would launch into his ministry? But that's not how it happened. Jesus went out, led by the Holy Spirit, so it wasn't a mistake, into the wilderness. Or in some translations, the desert. Now, that word translated wilderness or desert, it's not about sand or heat or any of the sort of mental images we have when we think of what a desert looks like. It's about solitude. It means the place of solitude, the place to be alone. So Jesus' response to that astonishing moment, rather than ploughing into a frenzy of work, which was good and important and valuable, was to go where he could be on his own and spend time with God. And you see this repeatedly in the Gospels. Let me read you three more little sections. This one's from Matthew 14. It's immediately after the huge public miracle of feeding 5,000 people. And it says, Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. And notice here, Jesus isn't just sending away those 5,000 people, but also his close friends. Now, obviously, there's a time to be with close friends, and they're incredibly valuable. Not much in this life is more valuable than friends. But there's also a time to leave them behind, go off on your own, just you and God. Here's another one. This is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. And at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Arguably the most important single decision that Jesus made throughout his ministry. And he didn't make it before spending time alone with God. Up on the mountain, about as uh, distant a place as you can find, as far away from other people as you can be. And here's one more. This is the last one I'm going to read you from Luke chapter 5 now. Jesus has just healed a leper from leprosy and told him to keep it a secret and it says despite Jesus's instructions the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases but Jesus often withdrew into the wilderness for prayer again wilderness here meaning the place of solitude at the time when everybody thinks he's the greatest and they're all thronging around him if you like, you would look at that and say, well, it's an opportunity to really boost the ministry and to make things happen. Um, and we might do that. You know, if we had thousands of people all wanting to come to our church, we'd lunge into it and we'd lay on all sorts of things. Jesus did the opposite. We drew to the wilderness for prayer. Often, it says. So what can we learn from this? Well, a big, big part of it is just making time to be alone with God. That means away from other people also away from your phone, uh, from books if you're a kind of person who enjoys reading and TV, every distraction, anything that will distract you. And it helps, I think, to have a place of solitude, the place that you go. That could be anywhere, whatever works for you, maybe a room in your home. For me, I find going for a walk is so much more helpful. Um, something about just being on the move helps to clear my mind, so I'm not thinking about a hundred other things. Uh, driving is even better. We're all driving less, I guess, during lockdown. But on occasions when I've had long drives, especially motorway drives, you know, it doesn't need a lot of my mind from moment to moment to drive. And that's just the best prayer time. Uh, Fiona has <laughs> literally put up a tent in the back garden, and that's where she goes uh, most mornings and spends the time alone, far from us, far from the family, not interrupted by me or the boys. Just listening to God, speaking to him informally, Sometimes studying, sometimes not. 
Um, for some of us, maybe uh, it'll be difficult to find a place, but a time of solitude might be more practical, especially if, you're, uh, if you've got young children, maybe, huh, depending on how young they are, how early in the morning they wake up, you may find that the time before they're awake works well for you. Now, this isn't easy to do, because as a practical matter, we always have things to be doing, don't we? Me as much as anyone. We've got our actual jobs, those of us who aren't kept out of them by the lockdown. Lots of us have children to look after. They can be very demanding. Some of us are caring for elderly relatives. They can be very demanding. Uh, we've got hobbies, uh, and I don't want to talk them down. You know, they're important. It is important to have unwinding time. Fiona off and I will often sit down uh, last thing before we go to bed and watch a couple of episodes of, of something funny together. You've got to have that time. Um, but you know, it's in the way of other things. Uh, and another thing that can get in the way and that can be such a distraction from time alone with God is church work. And anyone who's been involved in putting together the, the videos for Saturday morning or for uh, Sunday morning or for fun day Friday will know just how demanding those can be and what a distraction they can be even paradoxically from spending time with God. So all these things are going on and, and they're things that do need to happen. So how can we fit in time with God? Well, all I can say is this. In the end, I think we all make time for the things that we care about. So for me, one of those will be uh, football matches. If there's a football match on that I want to watch, nine times out of ten, I'll find a way to do it. Um, or you might have your favourite TV shows, and you'll make time for those. Uh, maybe you're somebody who likes reading a lot of books, and you'll make time. You will make time. Or computer games, of course, that's a big one. Um, can absorb so much time and, and if you love a game and there are games that I love uh, and I, I put loads of time into those games um, because you make time for what you really care about so we need to ask this question is time with God one of the things that we care about now I'm talking about chunks of time here I'm not, not just sort of 20 seconds of, of, of a prayer wedged in the middle of something else, you know, going around the supermarket, not that anyone should be going around the supermarket at the moment, get home deliveries, but you know, this kind of, in the process of everyday life, you just grab a moment and, and you pray something. And I, I'm not talking that down, I'm not saying that doesn't have value, but it's not what I'm talking about here. You know, those are good, but they're not enough. If we care about a relationship with the God who created us and who loved us and who redeemed us, we need to put in chunks of time, enough time, like if you have a conversation with a friend. You know, it's not enough just to say, hi, how are you doing? Oh, uh, fine, see ya. You know, that doesn't build a relationship. What does is spending time just sitting around, chatting about this and that, maybe talking about profound things, maybe talking about trivial things, but it does take a bit of time. So we just need to do what Jesus did, which is set time aside to get away from other people and stop in you know 10 or 20 or 30 minutes at a time and I, I feel uh, maybe not everybody would agree with this but to me I think if you uh, arrange like a daily time of prayer that's five minutes every day I think that's less useful than maybe once a week for half an hour because I just don't feel you can go deep in a very short time in a way that you can in a longer time and then when you've got a bit longer as well, you don't need to worry about being very focused in your praying. You know, some people like to use the ACTS acronym, A-C-T-S, so that when they pray, they make sure they begin with adoration and then confession and then thanksgiving and then supplication, which is asking for things. And again, I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But actually, if you've got a chunk of time to pray, you don't really need to race through a structure like that. You can let your thoughts wander. You don't, I find often when I'm praying, if my mind's wandering, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. That can be some of the best time because, you know, then my mind is going to the things that are occupying it and then those are the things that God speaks to me about. So it's just about time alone, time to spend with God, time to let the mind wander, and then, yes, of course, sometimes to pray in a more focused way about the things that come up. Now, why is all this important? Why is this what I'm bringing this Sunday morning? I want to make one thing really clear. Uh, this message is not a rebuke. Uh, my purpose here is absolutely not to say, 
you've got to work harder and find more time and spend more time with God. It's not that. It's an invitation. It's an invitation. We believe that we ultimately are going to spend eternity with God. And the reason that's the greatest possible way for us to spend eternity is because we were made by him and for him. Everything about us ultimately is focused on him. We're distracted by this life, but in the end, we are made for him. And we want to start working now towards the kind of understanding that we'll most fully enjoy in heaven. To begin the process of drawing closer to that great God who loved us before the foundation of the world. Of enjoying the one who is the source of every enjoyment on earth and in heaven. So I want to invite you to do that. I'm not telling you off if you're not doing it. I'm just saying you're missing out. Don't miss out. Seek God for yourself. Not just through other people's messages and other people's written study notes. Just your own time. And the last thing I want to say, and this is not part of the sermon, is that uh, if you want more concrete details about practical ways to do that, I do recommend the maturity course, uh, which I will be teaching, uh, starting, well, I'm running through the month of July. There will be three sessions. Uh, we don't yet know exactly when those will be, and that's because I want to try and make it available to as many as possible of the people who would like to do it. So if you get in touch with me, you can email mike at fcchurch.co.uk um, and let me know when are good times of the week for you, and I'll try and put together a program that suits as many of us as possible, and we'll go into all this in more depth. Thank you. Thank you. And Father, thank you that you love us and that what you have for us is love. It's an eternal kindness. It's a depth of love that we can only begin to understand a hint of now. And Lord, would you please draw us closer to you and let it be that day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, we're making the choices to come closer to you because we know that in the end, our greatest joy and satisfaction is found only in you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.